So I need to do a little testing. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Well, I feel like such a party pooper after all these gifts and fun things, and now we have to go back to work. And one more piece of bad news. Those of you who are here to hear what happened with the racing pigeons, the race finished at noon, and I have no idea who won. <laughs> so if that's what you came for, feel free to leave. <laughs> and Tara, I want to let, I didn't tell you this before, but I'm not going to talk about what I said I would talk about. <laughs> the title is the same, but the content's different. But there, it is, there is a slight variation in what I'm going to say uh, from what I, what's in the abstract. Uh, but I hope what, what I have to say is uh, a little bit more directly relevant to you because I want to report on some uh, research that we're doing on reading acquisition in immersion programs in contrast to summarizing research that other people have done. Um, and so there is a handout um, and we, uh, there's, a, there's some variation in what I'm going to say and what's in the handout on one of the slides, and I'll let you know what slide that is, although it probably won't make, make much difference because as you flip through the handout, you'll see that there's some of these pages you can't read because the printout wasn't done in, in handout mode but in presentation mode, so it's a, <laughs> it's a good activity. Okay? Okay. So the topic of uh, my presentation this afternoon is on learning to read in a second language. And I first of all want to acknowledge uh, people who have supported me, granting agencies, my university, and the Center for Research on Language, Brain, and Mind at McGill, who has also given us some support. And here's a little bit of a roadmap of uh, where I'm going. And uh, this is a, a more of a research-oriented talk. And I have to admit that it's uh, the analyses that I'm going to report on are in progress, and that's why there was a little bit of a uh, kerfuffle with the uh, handouts, because I kept changing it because we were doing the analyses as I was on the way to the plane. Um, so these are hot off the press, but uh, here's what I'd hope to do. I want to review uh, research findings on immersion in general, and, so, and a lot of this is stuff you've heard about at this conference and already know about. And then I'll review some research on reading outcomes for specific groups of learners. This also is somewhat old research, but uh, it may be worth repeating because I, uh, I don't hear people talking about these findings so much anymore, but they are rather important. And then I want to talk about a new study that we've been involved in for three over four years now on individual differences in learning to uh, read in a second language and also individual differences in oral language development. And uh, then at the end, I'll give you some of the implications of this research. So that even though I, I think this is a fairly kind of academic kind of study, I, I'd like to think at least that there's some fairly important practical implications uh, of these results. And, and I would also like to start off by saying that <clears throat> it's, it, it's interesting to me as I was thinking about this presentation that this research uh, is part of a a larger shift in thinking, I think, about immersion, where people are uh, starting to rethink the role of learners' first language in immersion programs. And the presentation that Roy Lister gave yesterday afternoon was another example of this, where he talked about a bilingual book project where students' first language and their second language were used in uh, a simple but very, very effective way to promote uh, language development and um, uh, reading skills. And uh, interestingly, in a, in a somewhat different way, this uh, research that I'm going to describe to you is also uh, uh, going to be making the claim that we should maybe be using the uh, language skills of first language learners uh, in order to identify individual differences and in particular to help us identify students who might be at risk for reading problems or language development problems and therefore would, might be at risk for dropping out of the program. So this is a group of kids we have not spent a lot of time talking about systematically although we do talk a lot about them pedagogically and we worry about them a lot. So to start off, what are, uh, these are the results that you probably all know about. These were our results that were generated initially in Montreal, I guess, in the early French immersion programs. And this, uh, these were results that looked at students' uh, uh, reading acquisition uh, with respect to um, English on the one hand and French on the other hand. So let me put this into context because what, what is interesting in this room is that uh, uh, there's lots of different kinds of immersion programs. And the results that I'm going to talk about 
our results that were uh, uh, collected in programs which were the sort of the classic Canadian immersion program where the students were uh, English uh, dominant and English monolingual for the most part. They, the results I'm going to talk about are for students who were in an early total immersion program in French. All of their instruction was in French in kindergarten, grade one and grade two, and there was no English instruction until grade three. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind because we're talking about uh, uh, students who speak a majority language at home and they're in a sense learning another high prestige language, but maybe more importantly, they're learning another language that is uh, typologically quite similar. And at the end we might want to talk about whether the results I'm going to talk about, how generalizable they are to other second languages or language pairs. So in the initial research on immersion, as you probably all know, in general, what we did was we gave uh, students in immersion standardized tests of reading, competence. They were generally uh, tests of uh, word decoding, vocabulary, and of uh, reading comprehension. And what we found in the case of uh, the students' second language abilities, I'm going to focus on their second language abilities because we know that they have no problems in learning to read in their first language. I mean, this is one thing that's, I think, generally agreed upon. So these are results about French reading. And what people have generally found is when you look at uh, decoding and comprehension skills um, in French reading, uh, immersion students do as well as native speakers, at least th when you compare them to French native speakers in Montreal. Um, and they do, both of these groups obviously do much better than non-immersion students. So on average, students in early total immersion programs uh, uh, achieve very uh, uh, impressive levels of competence in reading French as a second language. So the important point here is that this is uh, results for students as a whole, and it's that contrast with individual differences that I want to make later on. Now, there's also, there is also research done early on that looked at the performance of uh, Anglophone students in French immersion programs who were uh, at risk for reading difficulties uh, or for academic achievement for reasons that you, you would consider non-clinical. And these were students, on the one hand, who came from uh, disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. So these are students who typically, for reasons that we don't fully understand, uh, don't do as well in school as children who come from more advantaged families. And in Montreal, this was an important issue because of Montreal and Quebec in general, of course, French is the official language. Learning French was not uh, simply a nicety. It was really an important skill for children to have. And so we couldn't afford to uh, allow our programs uh, to become the purview of uh, only average or above average students. It was important that we assess the effectiveness of these programs for students who might not otherwise do well in school because there, has, there is often a tendency for parents and for educators to think that these kinds of students should not be in an immersion program uh, with the common sense notion that uh, these children will have trouble in school and they will have even more uh, trouble in a school program where they're learning through the medium of a second language. And so we uh, did quite a bit of research in uh, uh, Quebec, but there's other, there are other studies that I could cite from Louisiana, for example, that's relevant to this point, that looked at students who came from uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, tried to assess their performance relative to either other students of similar backgrounds or to uh, norms of some sort. And uh, fortunately, what we found was that uh, immersion students from low so socioeconomic backgrounds did just as well as students uh, from the non-immersion program who are also disadvantaged socioeconomically. So in other words, being from this kind of a background, even though it uh, often results in less than stellar performance in school, it doesn't uh, pose a differential uh, problem for these students in comparison to what they would uh, face if they were in an all-English program. Uh, they're doing just as well as their, uh, their peers in the English program who are similarly from, poor disadvan from disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's been shown in a number of different settings, not simply in uh, Montreal, but also in Cincinnati, and as I said, in Louisiana. Now, another group in this, uh, uh, in this camp, in a sense, are students uh, with generally low levels of academic ability. And again, we don't quite know why this is, but there are certain students who um, 
do poorly in school because they seem to be, uh, have poor academic skills and or gen generally low intellectual abilities. But the way we looked at this was, this was the, old, the good old days when you can give kids all sorts of tests and you didn't need permission or consent and you just did it. So when I was doing this research in the 70s, uh, the school district that I was working in actually routinely administered IQ tests and I was able to use, the, use these IQ tests and the results of IQ tests that I arranged to administer to look at how well students in the below average range on an IQ test did in immersion in comparison to similar stu uh, students in the regular English program. And again, the, the, the point here was how well would these students fare when they're studying through the medium of a second language in comparison to being in a native language program. And once again, we found that these students were doing just as well. So that being schooled in a second language, of, of the immersion type at least, didn't pose an insurmountable uh, challenge for these students. They, uh, they um, uh, acquired skills in English, they acquired skills in academic subjects that were better than, uh, I'm sorry, they acquired English language skills and academic skills that were just as good as children in an English program, and at the same time, their French language skills were much better. So there's this pattern that we found that when you look at these subgroups of kids who you might think would not do well in an immersion program for a variety of reasons, they actually uh, aren't held back further in their English language development or their academic development as a result of immersion. And at the same time, they acquire competence in French. And as I mentioned earlier, their competence in uh, reading in French and their oral competence in French is much better than students who are in a conventional French language program. So, and this is very important in some settings where you want your program to be egalitarian and to be accessible to uh, all students. Now you might say, well, what else is there to know? Isn't this really all we need to know about uh, reading acquisition and students who might be at risk for problems? Uh, but I think there are some significant gaps in our understanding about reading acquisition. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, when I did a review of this research uh, fairly recently uh, for uh, Canadian Parents for French in, in Canada, one of the things that uh, occurred to me uh, was that we have very poor understanding of students who might fall on the upper end of the normal distribution as well as students who might fall at the lower end of the distribution. So we have very little understanding of how fluent native English speaking students in French immersion programs really are when it comes to reading in French. And one of the things that uh, people often comment on, and I was speaking to uh, Lyle French from Brazil about this, but this is a conversation I've also had with people in Canada, that students who have been in early immersion programs for a long time seldom choose to read in French once they get outside school. Uh, and there's a little bit of research that shows that um, students um, in grades five or six of an early to total immersion program while their reading performance is certainly acceptable and within the average range, that if you probe a little bit more deeply, it looks like that there are aspects of more complex reading and fluent reading that they don't handle so well. So uh, building meaning in complex te text, uh, relating what they're reading to what the background knowledge they have, it's not clear what their difficulties are, but it seems to be related to the processing of complex text. So I think that there's really much more, uh, a lot of room for, for research at that, for students who we actually might sh think should be fluent readers, and all students should be fluent readers, because to be a non-fluent reader means that you're probably not going to want to read. But the other group that I'm really gonna focus on are students who might struggle in learning to read, and students who might actually have a, a reading impairment. And there's, as you probably all know, those of you who work in immersion programs, one of the challenges in, in identifying children who are either at risk for reading impairment or actually have a reading impairment is how do you tease apart that it's really an impairment versus that they simply haven't got the language skills yet. So there's a confound here between these two factors which makes it difficult to really identify them. And so often there's a kind of wait and see attitude and we wait and wait, and then when we're finally convinced that they really have a reading problem, many of these children would have left the program by then, but they also have developed a, re a real reading problem, which becomes quite entrenched and quite impervious to uh, remediation. So there's an issue of identification. There's also an, an issue of identifying these children so that we can provide them uh, with additional support. And um, it, you'll see in the long run, 
as I talk through this, there's also a question of what is the role of the first language in all of this. And I think there is a significant role, particularly at the assessment end, but possibly even at the intervention end. So I, what I want to do with you in the time that I have is describe uh, a study we did which we're call, calling the Individual Differences Study. And this is actually the dissertation of a graduate student of mine, Carolyn Erdos, who is uh, busy writing up her results. Um, and this has been a, a collaborative effort w uh, with myself, a colleague from education, Robert Savage. Roy Lister has been involved in this and now a postdoctoral student, Corrine Hay. And uh, for those of you who have ever done longitudinal research, I, I haven't done longitudinal research of this sort. It's a real challenge, I have to say. But there are a number of questions that motivated our, um, uh, our research, and I want to review these with you um, before I give you the results, because I think that um, while some of you may uh, uh, struggle with the results that I present, I, I think that all of us can re relate to these questions, because the questions are fundamentally uh, very practical questions. So one of the questions is, is a risk for reading difficulty different from risk for language learning difficulty? And the, the reason why I'm putting this question at the very beginning is that if you read through the, liter the research literature on uh, children who are at risk in either a French, in immersion programs, or if you look at reading, uh, research on reading acquisition in English language learners, say in the US or Canada, what is striking is, first of all, how little research there is on these children, but secondly, they tend to identify these children as learning disabled. And the classification of learning disability is based on, often on uh, district or local tests of a rather general sort, and these children tend to fall below one standard deviation with respect to the district norms. And then they people do the research or they do whatever they're going to do, but there's very, very little precision as to what these children's difficulties really are. And so I've got put this graphic up to try and explain what the dilemma is, is that we're first of all talking about children, uh, you, you know, assuming that there's a kind of normal distribution in performance in school. Uh, it could be with respect to academic achievement, it could be with respect to uh, oral language development, it could be with respect to reading acquisition. You expect some children to be ex excel, you expect some children to be at the lower end, but a lot of the kids are going to be in the middle. So we're concerned with these children who are at the lower end. And, and, with the, and this is a rather small space, but it's crowded. It's a very crow crowded space in the sense that there are lots of different kinds of kids in this lower end. There are not a lot of them, uh, but it's a confused group in the sense that Within this group, you have children who have what would be considered a true clinical disability. And this might be a language impairment or it might be a reading impairment. These children uh, often are eligible for specialized services within a school or a school district, and they uh, get specialized services from uh, specially trained people. But also within this, uh, low, uh, within this group at the low end, <clears throat> there are children who aren't language impaired or reading impaired, they're just slow readers or slow language learners. For a variety, it may be something related to their own learning style, it might be related to their educational experience, but it's not indicative of some kind of endogenous uh, learning difficulty or disability that they have. But they, they, would, they, would, they would be in the bottom of this distribution because their scores are low, but not because of an inherent impairment that they have, but for other reasons. And when you're talking about second language learners or students being schooled through the medium of a second language, uh, you also have children down here whose language skills simply are not well developed. They haven't mastered the language yet. So their reading difficulties and their language difficulties are only that, they're, they're, they're difficulties, they're not impairment. So in providing um, appropriate um, uh, support for these students, it's probably very, very important that we uh, distinguish between these different groups of learners. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one way of addressing this issue of how to disentangle, uh, from this slide, how to disentangle students who might have a, uh, an impairment versus students who might simply be um, uh, rather slow second language learners, we asked the question of whether you could use 
a student's first language skills as an indicator of whether they're going to be at risk in acquiring the second language, both with respect to acquiring the language orally, but also with, res with respect to acquiring literacy skills in the language. And this is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. There is a, a lot of uh, research uh, that's looked at uh, transfer or tr uh, cross-linguistic relationships between first and second language skills. A lot of this has actually been done in the US, and it's been done with minority language students. And there's considerable evidence that there's transfer of certain kinds of um, uh, skills from the first language to the second language. And often this transfer is uh, most evident uh, and statistically most significant in domains of language which are uh, related to literacy, the ac acquisition of academic language, or what some people are now calling at the interface between language and cognition. Um, we don't have a, a, a really solid understanding of this. Uh, we understand some of it better than other, other aspects of it. Uh, but this re our research was really an attempt to look at these issues within this particular population of students. And I guess what also distinguishes our efforts from some of the other research that has found this is that this was a very comprehensive uh, examination of this cross-linguistic transfer issue um, and a longitudinal study, as you'll see. Um, so, the, 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 this is not just a theoretical issue, this is a very, very practical issue because if there is good evidence that L1 skills can be used to predict L2 difficulties, that means that as educators we might be able to uh, assess immersion students in the native language very, very early on, identify students who uh, deserve or require special support and start to give them that support uh, very early on and it's estimated that a lot of the reading problems that kids have later on could have been avoided if we had actually provided them with additional support early on, rather than taking a wait and see attitude. So a related issue is how early in schooling can L1 indices be used to predict L2 reading? Uh, and the issue here is again, it's sort of a, a theoretical one, but also a practical one, because the earlier you can use these L1 measures to predict, um, and there is a growing evidence that that the sooner you provide students with um, early intervention, the more likely you can curtail some of the difficulties that some of these students will have later on. Um, and finally, from a more theoretical perspective, but I also think from an intervention perspective and an instructional perspective, the question is, are the predictors of uh, uh, word reading are the same as the predictors of reading comprehension. And here the question is, what are the important components of learning to read in a, la in a first language and in a second language? And this part of our research was uh, heavily motivated by what's called the simple view of, of reading, which has been around for a long time, actually, since the uh, late 80s. And uh, I'll come back to it later on, uh, but it postulates that there are uh, two important components of reading. One is related to word decoding. The other is related to reading comprehension. And that there's slightly different components of each of these that's important for success. So if you're, if you, if you're concerned about trying to identify children who are at risk for uh, reading difficulties, it becomes important not only to look at the word level or the decoding level, but also the uh, comprehension level. And in fact, there's a, a certain amount of uh, evidence that suggests that second language readers are more prone to have difficulty at the comprehension stage than at the word decoding stage. And if you look at the research on English language learners, in fact, which Don and I have seemed like we spent the last three years of our lives doing on a number of panels, um, English language learners sometimes even excel, do better than native speakers when it comes to word decoding and all that phonological stuff where they start to have real problems is when they have to comprehend for meaning and when they have to read to learn, as we say. So going from learning to read to reading to learn. And this is a component of reading acquisition we don't know a lot about, but it's important to uh, look at uh, these two major components if you're, uh, wa if you're concerned about identifying kids who need additional support and if you want to design support systems that are appropriate for um, uh, helping them to learn better. So there's a, from an intervention point of view, uh, one of the main tenets of a lot of this is that if you want to help kids with learning disabilities, you have to identify what their specific problems are. And there's often a tendency uh, to identify children as being learning disabled 
based on some uh, generic uh, test of achievement in the district. If they're below the st one standard deviation, they all get put together, and they may all, there can be a tendency for them all to be uh, treated in some generic way, but, but providing more individualized and differentiated intervention is probably going to be more successful. So that was our reason in, in looking at both the decoding and the comprehension piece, but also in trying to tease apart this issue of whether uh, reading uh, difficulty and language difficulty are the same thing. So this is what the study looks like. The fun part of the talk is over. Now we get down to business. You'll have to put on your researcher caps. I'll, I'm going to try to walk a line here between talking to some of those of you who are happy and comfortable with research and those of you who just want to know the results. Um, <laughs> And the results are actually more interesting than the rest of it, frankly. But this was a longitudinal study, and I'm going to report on, uh, I should have brought my, uh, my uh, little thing, but uh, I'm going to just talk about the phases, um, the, the early phases here. They, um, they, there's, in a sense, three phases to this research. The very first phase is the kindergarten phase. And in the... Um, in the kindergarten phase, we uh, uh, administered a battery of predictor tests to a large group of students in French immersion. And these predictor tests were all tests that, uh, they were all in English, these tests, and they are all tests that have uh, been identified by researchers who work in the English first language field as predictive of both reading development and oral language development. Okay. So you can imagine that the literacy predictors are related to knowledge of the alphabet, uh, letter-sound relationships, phonological awareness, blending, and so forth and so on. The uh, language predictors, uh, the one we relied on heavily was the TEGI, the Test of English Grammatical Impairment, but also the SELF, because it's widely used in, in clinical circles to identify monolingual English children who have oral language difficulties. So these tests were given to all of these children uh, both in the fall of kindergarten and in the spring of kindergarten. And, <clears throat> and this is amounted to about four hours of testing per child per session. And the reason why we did this is what we were, I was quite concerned about how early in development we could actually, or how early in school we could actually identify these children. Because the earlier you could do it, the, uh, the quicker you could actually start to give them uh, additional support. And then starting in um, uh, the spring of grade one, we started to uh, uh, administer a battery of outcome measures, and these were outcomes related to <coughs> data up to grade two, but we've only analyzed uh, data in up to grade one. The, the, this third phase of the study is really uh, the phase where we want to focus on reading comprehension. We have some reading comprehension data in, at the end of grade one, but it's not very robust because even at the end of grade one, students in immersion, their comprehension skills are still fairly rudimentary. So it's really only later on, we think, that we can start to look at reading comprehension in earnest. But I will give you some results on that phase. Um, these, just a little bit of background about who the children were. They live in Montreal. They're in an early total immersion program in kindergarten, grade one and grade two. Everything's in French. Uh, these, what's interesting about this, for those of you who know Montreal, is that the students were monolingual English-speaking or English-dominant students. Uh, there's a lot of students in these programs now who ha are in uh, mixed-language families, so they know some French, and we chose students who were dominant in English, but they may have had some French competencies as well. Uh, what's interesting about this is that um, this is probably somewhat unusual in, a, in an immersion context uh, where you have just one way immersion, but it's not unusual if you're looking at English language learners who are in a French, in a, say an English program, where, because some of these students may be monolingual in Spanish, but a lot of them will have some English. So having kids where there's a kind of mixture of language competencies is actually more, probably more representative of what goes on in second language classrooms than, than having a monolingual English group in French immersion. Okay. We didn't select these kids in any way whatsoever. If their parents were willing to sign the consent form, they were in the project. Um, and as I say, they were all individual sessions of testing. Okay. Here's the test for those of you who are really into this. I don't know whether this is coming out on the handout, but it was a very, very broad uh, test. These are the kindergarten predictor measures. You can see there's a lot of them. 
So what I'm going to do is uh, describe these results in two phases. I'm going to start by talking about what the kindergarten results actually looked like, and then I'll describe what the predictions actually looked like. So here we're talking about the analysis of the results on the predictor measures. Again, these are measures that have been found to predict oral language development and reading development in uh, monolingual English-speaking children who are in an English, in an English program. Um, first of all, you, this slide simply shows that there's actually a fair bit of stability in the, stu the performance of these students from the spring testing, to, from the fall testing to the spring testing. This actually surprised me quite a bit because having worked with kindergarten children before, uh, they're often, their behavior can be notoriously unreliable over the course of kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> certainly when you try to talk to them. Um, and um, they're certainly in their social behavior changes quite radically over the course of the kindergarten year. But you can see by this linear trend, the results are actually flipped in a funny way. That uh, as their scores go up in the fall testing, they also were higher in the spring testing. So what this means was that uh, the, fall t the fall testing results were actually, could be a pretty good entry point for trying to identify children who might be at, at risk for difficulty or you could wait till kindergarten. There's a tendency to wait till kindergarten, but these results suggest that you might be able to use the fall kindergarten results at intake to start to differentiate in these children and provide individualized instructional programs. Now, the other thing that was also very interesting and not very surprising, I suppose, um, but these are the results of uh, principal components factor analysis. The left-hand table is the results of the fall analysis and the right-hand table is the results of the spring analysis. And the only thing you really need to know about this is that when you do a fa what a factor analysis does, for those of you who are not familiar with them, it tells you uh, for a group of children who take a lot of tests how the, their performance on this, these tests cluster. And uh, by, it's looking at the intercorrelations in their scores on different tests with the assumption that if scores uh, are highly intercorrelated, there's a good chance that whatever those tests say they're measuring, they may be measuring the same kind of thing. So whatever kids uh, have uh, that's good for this test is also good for that test. So by looking at the test, you can say, well, what are these tests assessing? So what we found was that there was a, a group of tests uh, that, uh, that uh, cluster together, and these are all tests that look at language, and to some extent IQ. And there is another group of tests that were related, that are highly loaded on skills related to literacy. Now, this is not surprising because we chose these tests to do this, but people have rarely actually looked at these tests in these ways. They, when people do this kind of research, they're interested in reading impairment or language impairment, and they don't often put the two things together. So these results would suggest that, in fact, there is a difference between kids who are at risk for reading impairment and, a disc, and, a different, and kids who are at risk for um, language impairment. And then we'll see later on in the predictions if that's actually true. So the idea is that um, if you're going to plan a, a remediation or intervention in a school, you should really be thinking about differentiated remediation because there may be different risk profiles. So th these are the results. It's just uh, saying in words uh, what I've already said uh, with respect to this individual slides. There's quite a bit of stability from fall to spring. Uh, the fall kindergarten reading predictors in English could be useful to identify students who need additional support in reading. Um, and there, there is some evidence that there's diff different uh, risk profiles. So what actually comes out of the predictions. So here I'm going to focus on the relationship between the predictor measures in kindergarten and the outcome measures in grade one. And as I said before, um, the grade one results are, are pretty good for looking at word decoding and they're okay for looking at reading comprehension, but we're not as confident about the reading comprehension results um, as we would like to be, and that's simply because at this stage in development, these students' reading comprehension skills are fairly basic. So graphically, that's what we're looking at. So as I said, we're interested in, uh, in, in a, a kind of a simple uh, model of reading acquisition, which is called the simple view of reading. And it's actually represented as a formula that says reading comprehension is the product of uh, listening comprehension plus decoding. And th I think this is, in and of itself, is an important point to make from a strictly educational point of view at this point in history, 
because there's been so much emphasis on word decoding and phonological awareness and phonological processing that there's a tendency to fo focus on this as if this is all that is involved in learning to read. And, uh, and in the monolingual uh, reading acquisition literature, people don't believe that. They believe that decoding is the way into reading, but it's not the way out. Um, and it's, it follows that having problems with decoding skills can create problems with reading comprehension because you spend all of your time decoding, you don't have any cognitive space left over to read and comprehend at a sentence or a paragraph level, so it's difficult for you to abstract meaning from complex text. Um, but it's also the converse is true that you can have students who decode well and they can read a passage but they can't understand it. And you know this is well documented, but we've had a tendency to forget that in this era of emphasis on word decoding. So here's the results um, for prediction from a fall to uh, the end of grade one for word decoding and comprehension. And I've just summarized these in words. And what you see here is that the single uh, most important predictor of word decoding in grade one, this is in French. Remember, we're looking at reading measures in French, but predictor measures in English. So if you're looking at word decoding at the end of grade one in French, <clears throat> the single most important predictor was English letter name knowledge. So kids who know the names of the letters of the alphabet um, are significantly better uh, word decoders than kids who don't know the names of the letters of the alphabet. Um, and that actually accounts for 24% of the variance within the grade one reading scores. Now that may not sound like a lot, but it's actually a fairly substantial amount of variance that you're accounting for, given that you're talking about almost two full school years, because you're going from fall of kindergarten to spring of grade one, and you're talking about a predictor measure that's in English and an outcome measure that's in French. Um, but it's also the case that the, uh, the prediction is enhanced if you look at uh, how much French the students already know. So the student's French receptive vocabulary is also a uh, significant predictor. But interestingly, it wasn't as significant as the letter uh, name knowledge. So vocabulary in French was not, even though they're reading French words, that was not as important in their reading as was their um, knowledge of letter names um, in English. <clears throat> in contrast, if you look at the comprehension measures, it's a more complex picture. Uh, in, in the, you, the, there's decoding skills that are relevant. Again, the, decoding, the, the predictor measures are in English, so blending skills in English. And the English letter name knowledge is important in predicting reading comprehension in French. But as well, there's this thing called English uh, rapid naming. And this is a test that's widely used in the reading uh, uh, research uh, that is related to access to labels. So what students have to do is they, there's a variety of forms of this test. You give uh, students a set of pictures of common objects, and you measure how quickly they can name these objects in a given period of time. And uh, it's, what, it's widely believed that this is a measure of more general language processing ability, because what you're doing is you're accessing the label from long-term memory. Um, so what you start to see is some uh, support, arguably, for this simple view that reading comprehension is related to both uh, decoding skills, but also uh, more general language processing abilities, not just at the letter sound level. And again, French reading uh, receptive vocabulary is important. Now, it's interesting, at this point, we were able to predict 55% of the variance in the grade one reading comprehension scores. And most of this is coming from uh, predictor tests that are in English. So this is really quite substantial. Here's what the results look like um, when you use the spring predictors. And what you can notice from the bottom is that the, predictor, the predictions are substantially better. So word knowledge can be predicted, 48% uh, of the variance in word knowledge is being predicted. If you go from spring of kindergarten to grade one, rather than fall of kindergarten to grade one, and reading comprehension, uh, variance in reading comprehension, 67% of that can be predicted. And again, the most significant predictors are measures of e either uh, English uh, letter name knowledge, English uh, sound blending, or uh, rapid naming in English. 
So there's considerable evidence from all, from all of this evidence of these cross-linguistic effects that I uh, talked about before, and there's also considerable evidence that different kinds of skills are important for mediating word decoding and reading comprehension, and that there's significant improvement in prediction from fall to kindergarten, which you would expect. Now, it's interesting, um, when we were talking about these analyses, I said to Caroline, I said, well, what happens if you look at the, in the, in the spring level, kids have been in French immersion for a year, everything's in French, all of their reading instruction is in French, what, what's, what's the situation with their, uh, the reading uh, uh, predictors in French. What would happen if you put in uh, French decoding, French letter sound knowledge, and so forth and so on in, in spring of kindergarten? I would expect that that would significantly enhance your prediction of the grade one results. And she said the really, it did not, we put those in and it simply did not emerge as a significant predictor because they're not well enough along on that even at the end of kindergarten. So this is rather interesting because I was surprised at that actually. And this is, remember, this is in an environment where French is the dominant language, not necessarily of all the children, but of the community at large. So it, it, if to the extent that these results are, are valid, it underscores how uh, important looking at students' L1 skills are, even once they get into the program and they've been in the program for a year, because their French, their second language abilities, even at the end of kindergarten, may not be sufficiently well developed to give you a good, indica good, good indication of how they're going to do later on. So, I've kind of said this, and I don't think I need to say it again. Okay, so what I want to do now is go back to this other issue of uh, these uh, risk for language impairment versus reading impairment. And uh, this has uh, become a very big issue in the research literate and first language acquisition. To what ex there's, a t there's a very strong tendency for children who are, are, have a language impairment, a clinical language impairment in English, to also have reading impairment, to have reading difficulties. Um, so we know that there is this overlap in risk for reading and language impairment, but the problem is, the, and I can't get into this this afternoon, but the way the research has been done, it's not, uh, it's not very easy to figure out to what extent language impairment necessarily entails a reading impairment. In other words, are all the kids who have a language impairment going to have a reading impairment and vice versa? Because the way they've done the studies, you'd almost think that, uh, but by looking at this kind of a general population as we have, doing, giving independent sets of predictors, we're able to see whether these risk profiles actually, how much they overlap and how much they don't. So this is a way of trying to disentangle the space that's down at the, at the lower end of the distribution. So this is a rather complex slide, but uh, let me try and explain it to you. The, gra the circle on the left represents all the kids who we identified as being at risk for a language impairment, LI, using the battery of tests that we used. So anybody who falls with, you know, you all know your Venn diagrams, I'm sure. Anybody who falls within the left-hand circle was somebody who we identified as being at language impairment, using criteria that are very standard within the speech and language community, speech and language pathologists. In fact, Caroline is a certified speech and language pathologist. So the tests we're using are routinely used in the English community to identify kids who would, would uh, warrant language services because they're language impaired. And on the right-hand side are children who would be identified as risk for reading impairment because they're falling one standard deviation below the um, mean on a variety of tests. And this is, again, one of the ways that people typically identify kids for reading impairment. And what you can see is that uh, there are kids who have only reading impairment. Those are the kids who are on the left-hand part of the diagram that doesn't overlap with the right-hand circle, and there are kids who are at risk for reading impairment but are not at risk for language impairment, but there are a lot of children in the middle who are at risk for both at, at this point in our assessment. Okay? So, on the, so on the one hand, these risk profiles are distinctive, but at the same time, there are a lot of children who have both risk factors. Um, we then did some analyses to look at how uh, accurately we could predict um, uh, uh, risk for uh, uh, an L2 reading impairment. And again, what we, so what we did is we looked at, um, and I won't get into the details of this unless you're interested, but we classified these children 
as being, reading as being at risk for reading impaired and might actually be considered reading impaired because they scored one standard deviation below the mean on one of our reading measures that's widely used for this purpose. And those were the risk group and then everybody else was the non-risk group. And then we, we uh, entered all of the other tests into our analysis. This is called a discriminant function analysis to see whether these tests would actually distinguish between these two groups of learners. And in fact, we were able to predict 88% of the kids at risk using these tests. And we were able to identify 71% of the kids who were not at risk. And the most significant predictors using the fall tests were again these, um, these small unit skills blending and uh, interestingly ran RAS. This is this um, rapid uh, access to names. Um, when you look at the spring results, they're somewhat better. Um, you see that we can predict, again, the kids who are at risk uh, for reading impairment uh, with an accuracy of 88%. This is very high. And, even, and at this point, we can also uh, predict the kids who are not at risk up to 90% accuracy. And again, these are all using L1 measures. So this is really, this, we're explaining quite a bit of the variability and we're able to make fairly uh, differentiated uh, diagnoses of these children's difficulties. Um, we also have done some research looking at language impairment, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but you can see here if we use the fall predictors, you can predict the, and so the students were classified at risk for language impairment based on their performance on the uh, story uh, sentence recall task of the self, which is a widely used test of, of, uh, of risk for language development. And you can see that we could identify the kids. Uh, this is in L1, because the students' L2 oral language skills are not sufficiently developed for us to make this classification. But our accuracy for the at-risk kids is 71%, and for the non-risk kids is 75%. And this increases uh, for the at-risk kids to 86%. And the only other thing to note here is that the best single predictors here are language measures, which is this, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the measure we used to diagnose them at risk was, was the concepts and following directions subtest of the self. And the best predictor of that was the recall of sentences subtest, which is very, very much in line with what you find if you're working only in an L1 context. OK, summary. I've given you a lot of data, some of which you may have understood, some of which you may not have. We're, we're not sure we still fully understand it yet. As I say, we're, we're still coming to terms with this. But I think that there's a lot that's actually very interesting and a lot that is potentially very useful. Um, and, in, and frankly, a lot of it that's not particularly surprising when you look at all of the research, but it's reaffirming, reaffirming to see that we're getting these patterns in these kinds of students. So. Um, it with respect to this business of risk profile, uh, it looks like risk for reading and language learning difficulty can be distinct, and they often are, as you saw from that diagram with the two Venn uh, circles. Um, but there's also a significant proportion of at-risk children who are at risk for both language and reading impairment. Um, but it's important to differentiate these groups. Who has reading impairment o is at risk for reading impairment only? Who might be at risk for language impairment only? And who's at risk for both? Because the effectiveness of your intervention is going to depend upon how closely you tailor your intervention to what their specific needs are. Treating all children as if they have all risk is probably not going to be as effective, nor is it as efficient as identifying the specific needs of uh, children and then tailoring your work with them accordingly. And what you've also seen, I think, is that these L1 predictors are actually can provide a reasonable identification of emergent students who might have later reading difficulty. These are rather high correlations, and uh, there's a very large proportion of the variance that's accounted for by these L1 measures, even though the L2 measures, uh, the outcome measures are in a second language. And a significant predictability even from the fall of kindergarten to the spring of grade one. So identification could be done as early as the fall of grade one, um, but it improves if you do identification in the spring of kindergarten. And so we're work the, the school district that we're working in is uh, de developing a teacher checklist that will uh, be used by the kindergarten teacher 
at teachers at the end of kindergarten to help identify children who they think are not doing well on these kinds of predictor measures so that when they go into kindergarten, the, the grade one, the grade one teacher will start to give these students supplemental or additional support in the uh, skills that they seem to be lacking. And at this point, it's really these small unit skills, um, phonological awareness and so forth and so on. And I think as you've maybe seen, the risk for decoding and reading comprehension problems seem to entail different difficulties. Um, our results are very compatible with what everybody else is finding, is that the decoding problems are very, very heavily related to um, phonological awareness, knowledge of the alphabetic principle, and so forth and so on, knowledge of these so-called small units. We have some evidence that comprehension relies on the decoding skills, but also requires Langu language skills of a higher order, but we don't have a very good grasp of that from our data, and quite frankly, uh, researchers don't either. This business of, of difficulty with reading comprehension is only now beginning to get the attention of reading researchers. And in general, what we found is that the predictors of reading and language difficulty in immersion students are the same as those for students in an L1 program, and there's evidence for this simple view. We're also finding that, there, uh, that our rates of, uh, uh, at risk are similar to what other people have reported and using quite different methods. So in other words, being in an immersion program itself is not a risk factor, which you know, if you work in some school districts, the skeptics always think that, well, kids who have reading problems, they have reading problems because they're an immersion or they have language problems because they're an immersion. There's that, this along with other evidence, there's no, doesn't support that contention. Um, I would also conjecture that based on the similarities between what we're finding and what L1 researchers are finding, it's likely that the interventions that you would want to give to immersion students for reading, at least, I'm not sure about language impairment, are likely to be the same as those that you would provide for L1 students and with other language sup supplements because they're obviously not native speakers. In other words, we don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to providing additional support for students in immersion. A lot of what we do, we have to, ma we have to modify it to be suitable for students who are learning through a second language. But the basic techniques and the ba ba basic focus of attention is probably largely going to be the same. There may be other things we have to add in to the support system because these are second language learners, not native speakers, but the basic approach is probably going to be very similar. Now, what I want to, one thing I want to say here is that we know in the case of kids who have word decoding problems that it's very, it's highly effective to provide these children with fairly direct and explicit instruction in uh, uh, phonological processing skills, letter, sound relationships, and so forth and so on. Um, and that actually does improve their decoding skills a great deal. Um, but we all, but what, what I think is important about this comprehension, uh, these comprehension results is that they're saying that being a good decoder is not going to be good enough to comprehend well. And it's probably not going to be enough to comprehend written text in your second language for meaning of a fairly advanced cognitive nature so when you get into grades three, four, and five. Um, so it's not enough to simply support these kids in decoding, we have to be supporting them in their general language development in the early grades so that when they get to the higher grades, they have those kinds of uh, language skills that they need to comprehend text. Do you see what I'm saying? Because otherwise there's a tendency for people to think in the, of this simple view as saying, decoding first, reading comprehension next. Phonological processing skills, and then general language skills. But it, it won't work, I don't think. What you have to be doing, it's a foreground kind of background thing. In the early grades, the foreground is small units decoding skills, but in the background, we have to be building these students uh, more general and more sophisticated language skills so that when they get to grades three and four, they can draw on their knowledge of French grammar or English grammar to deconstruct meaning from these passages. Otherwise, there's a tendency to see it as a very linear uh, progression. Um, so I want to go back to this general issue of links between L1 and L2. And, and this is yet, an, I think, another uh, piece of evidence that suggests that contrary to the way that we have tended to teach, treat the two languages in immersion programs, that the wisest thing may not be to keep them entirely separate. Um, and that in this particular case, 
what we're seeing is uh, this uh, evidence for these cross-linguistic effects, I think has significant implications for assessment and identification of children who might be at risk for certainly reading problems and possibly also language learning problems. So that um, it, it, it may, I think it's really behooves us to look at how we might use the L1 skills or even L1 intervention of immersion students uh, strategically in order to uh, identify their strengths and their weaknesses so that we can develop uh, differentiated instruction for them that, that is effective. I'm not saying that the intervention should necessarily be in the first language. It can be in the second language. But, until, but in the preliminary stages, using the first language may give us some insights about where, how those second language programs should be structured. So thank you. Uh, we're, we'll take a few minutes for questions. Those of you who have a plane to catch or a train, feel free to leave. But if you have questions, I'm happy to, or criticisms, I'm happy to take them. Julie's got the microphone. Sorry, I'm having trouble. How do you test the students in the French receptive vocabulary? What uh, In the French receptive vocabulary is a, is a French version of the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. So there is a version of that test that has been developed in and standardized in Canada in French. So it's really, you, set, you show pictures, four pictures, you give a word in French and they choose the appropriate word. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I was also wondering if um, this idea of keeping the languages separate and maybe not necessarily having to keep them separate would also apply to languages in non cognate programs? <laughs> Well, that's a good question. So the question was, uh, and, you're, and with respect to this research, would we expect the same kinds of results if it's English and Chinese? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Well, I, uh, my guess is that the same general trends and patterns would emerge, even if you've got non-typologically similar languages, but that the degree of uh, uh, correlation is probably not going to be as great. So if you're looking at correlations between, say, um, English and Chinese versus English and Spanish or English and French, my guess is that there are many processes involved in reading acquisition that are common to these two languages, but there's also some important differences. Whereas when you look at English and French, the similarities in some ways are probably much greater than the differences. Well, I, I mean, there's actually room for a lot of good in, intervention research, but my bias would be if you've got a, a student who you think is going to have trouble with uh, word decoding and you and doesn't seem that they know the letters or the sounds of the alphabet, and if it's in a total immersion program, I would do it in the second language. If you're in a if you're in a 50-50 kind of program. You might want to do it in both, but you might want to not, you might not want to do it in both at the same time because there could be confusion. What I'm saying at L1 interventions, I mean L1 interventions in English that happen in an English program. But if you're talking about a, a Spanish immersion program, the interventions, as I was just saying, I think should be in the language of instruction. So even though the student's native language it might be English, as it would be in North America, um, but if the, if the immersion language is Spanish or French, and it's a total immersion program, do it in Spanish or French. There's likely to be a lot of transfer back and forth. And there's going to be a little bit of confusion, 
but it also speaks to this more general issue of uh, judiciously using both languages to teach the students. So if there's, if there's letters of the, the, the alphabet that have very, very different names in the two languages, just teach those. We've had a tendency to kind of rigorously keep them totally separate, but probably in the kids' minds, they're making connections and we're not actually intervening to help them get the right connections.